Hello and welcome to the Wisden Cricket Weekly Podcast in association with Laithwaite Wine, who are the official wine partners of the England and Wales Cricket Board. Laithwaite stop at nothing to bring you great wines and have done so for over 50 years. As part of our partnership, you are able to get 25% off six bottles when using the code WISDON at checkout. We've got a belter of a show lined up for you today, folks. Ben Stokes, just three games into his ODI return, broke an all-time England ODI record. The World Cup is just a few weeks away. A couple of other England players had very important weeks. There was a historic series victory for Sri Lanka women, a crazy final day in the latest round of the county championship. And we've also got one of our all-time favourite sponsorship activations coming up around the halfway point. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is Joe Harmon, Phil Walker and Ben Garner. But first, let's head to Mark Butcher to hear his thoughts on the England-New Zealand series. Butch, very good weeks for Liam Livingston and Dawid Milan. Uh, never in doubt. <laughs> well, the Dawid Milan one wasn't, really. Um, people, I think, I, I just get the impression that people want Dawid Milan not to, to score any runs. And the more that they want him not to, the more he scores. Um, his record in, in ODIs is, is phenomenal. Um, as it as it is in in T Twenty internationals as well, and uh, and for me he's a shoe in at the top of the order with um, with Johnny Bairstow. Uh, I think it's the the best way for England to kind of get all of their resources into the team. I mean, clearly you know in the yesterday's one day international they played what, four out and out seamers. They might not do that given varying conditions in India. Um, but yeah, I I, I think. I think it's just I think it's just an absolute no-brainer that Milan kind of um, usurps Jason Roy at the, at the top of the order, um, and that England sort of work work from there. I mean, Joe Root's lack of form at the moment is not really a mass, massive issue to anybody. The series has been um, particularly low-key with with sort of thumpings one way one way or or another, and then of course Ben Stokes on one leg gets that makes England's highest ever ODI score. So. You know, it's low key on the one hand, but but certain people have kind of had have, have had points to prove, um, um, or disprove it over the course of it, and and by and large that's happening. Mm. Um, we've got a question in on Milan from Matt, who asked, "Why is Milan so often touted as the first batter to be dropped from the ODI side when his record is clearly outstanding?" And I was thinking about this myself, and I think that in T Twenty cricket, he had that amazing run that sort of went against what we'd seen in his career. Um, in various leagues, there's so much T20 cricket that's not international, um, and yeah. I think there was enough there to inform to inform us on on what he what we should expect at international level. And there was a suspicion that, that form wasn't sustainable, which was sort of proven to be the case. It's dropped off in the last few years. He had two quite World Cups, got dropped in the hundred. But I think his game is just suited so much more to ODI cricket. He scores very quickly without taking too many risks. He's very good in the power play. Yesterday, thirteen for two. He was able to maintain a run rate of around a runner ball with Stokes very quickly. Yeah, you could more easily envisage him having a very good tournament against the best bowlers in the world in this format. I mean, you said that you think he should start the tournament. Do you think England will make that call? I think I think they will. I, I think he's <clears throat> he's making a compelling case um, to do so, um, where others are making no case whatsoever. Um, you know, the, the one thing I think that goes against to, to answer the guy's question. One thing that I think goes against Dan Milan is that he's kind of missed out on the on the glory. You know, he kind of wasn't part of the 2019, and, and there's there's been quite quite a, a selectorial um, sort of bias towards people who were involved back then, regardless of whether or not their you know their form um, in in I wasn't going to say recent months, in recent sort of um, half years um, mm-hmm. has sort of not really warranted that kind of um, uh, that kind of loyalty. Um, and so I think that's probably what it is. I, I also think he's a little bit unfashionable in terms of, you know, he, he doesn't sort of bristle with muscle and, and, you know, he's not Joe Root and he's not, um, you know, one of the one of the assassins um, like Livingston or Roy or Bearstow. And so therefore people are kind of like find, find it a little bit tricky to kind of get their heads around what Dowd Milan's all about. But what he is, he's just a very, very fine player mm. um, who has who has enough of the modern batter in him, i.e. the sort of the power hitting more than enough, actually when required um and 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 enough of the sort of the old school accumulator um style of a 50 over batter to be very very effective and i and i really do think that sort of like the top of the order is going to be the best spot for him in the in the lineup mm. um and on jason roy if he's not in the 11 
Do England take him? He, he's not the most flexible batter to have in reserve. He only opens the batting. And then from a fitness point of view, back spasms have meant that he's not taken a part in this series so far. But also going back over the last four or five years, for a batter, he is quite injury prone, which is probably not what you're looking for in a spare batter in a 15-man squad. No, um, and, you know, given all the the travelling and all the internal flights and all the rest of it, it's kind of it's 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 a pretty it's a pretty brutal um, schedule for for all of the teams in the World Cup. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, the flexibility issue is is the main one, really. Um, in that, you know, somebody like Harry Brook, if if he turns out to be a spare batter, I can still see a way that they get him into into an eleven, but not as an opener. Um, you know, is that he can he can bat anywhere between one and seven. Um, and as you quite rightly say, that you're not you're not going to put Jason anywhere really than, than in the top three, and, and probably opening would be the would would be the, the one spot with with Joe batting at three anyway. So I, I think he's struggling. I really do. And and it's not. And, and this is not a slide because obviously I'm a, a massive fan and have been for years. But you know his his, his style of play, um, his his lack of sort of product productivity over a very long stretch of time. Um, and you couple that with sort of like injuries, which seem to come out of nowhere. You're kind of thinking, well, you know, it's it's a risk too far. Um, and so, you know, when that squad gets <clears throat> whittled down to to 15, you've got to be 100 percent sure that you that you've got all of the right um, attributes on the plane with you. And at the moment, well, not even at the moment. I think for quite a long time now, I think it, it would be safe to say that Jason hasn't quite, um, you know, warranted the loyalty that he's had from the from the people selecting him. Mm. Um, and on Livingston, I thought he was brilliant at Cardiff coming in at 55 for five, scores 95 not out. And I think that I, I forget that this is a guy who once got a test call up by virtue of averaging 50 in the championship. And it's just his role in T20 cricket is is to basically, his remit is to whack it from ball one coming in yeah. at six and seven. He doesn't get to build innings. I saw a stat, uh, which I almost didn't believe that he'd, he'd gone 115 innings across formats without facing 50 without balls. He just doesn't get to build balls. innings. Yeah. Um, but actually, that was a timely reminder that he could be the adaptable number six or seven that England so desperately need. Yeah, and 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 England have got, provided they kind of they get the right fifteen on the plane, they've got about three or four guys who you could say could do that too, which is which is really handy. I mean, it's such a it's such a tough position to bat. You know, you you've got the two, the two scenarios you can find yourself in one where, where it's just literally hell for leather. Um, the other way, you, where you fall down for not many, and you've got a long, long time to bat, and so you need you need skillful and mentally strong people to to fill in those sort of five, six, not quite so much seven, but five and six for sure in in a fifty over lineup. And England have got potentially, definitely two and maybe three that that could do it, which is which is fabulous, you know. Um, and and it's great, great to see him do it actually, because you know we we sort of talked about it in the. Uh, and our live show about how we just, you know, we just hadn't seen anything from him for so long now. Um, none, none of us sort of thought that he, it was wrong that he was in the squad and that he should be going on playing. But it was kind of like, right, come on, when are we, when are we going to see a little bit of return on this undoubted potential? Uh, and then he goes and, and plays the way he did in Cardiff. Picked up three wickets yesterday, um, and so you know, hurrah! He obviously, he obviously listened to us. Yeah. <laughs> um... A week or so ago, I got kind of got the impression that, you know, nine out of the 10 teams that um, are going to be at the World Cup are all playing pretty competitive ODI cricket at the moment. And following what's going on in South Africa, what's happening in the Asia Cup, it sort of looked like England's main rivals were making last minute, you know, fine tunements to, to their 11s, to their squads, etc. Whereas England, they had this core that would were, were literally re- trying to remember how this format works. Um, it's only three games. Uh, they they got thumped in the first game. Uh, Livingston bailed them out in the second, and they had that amazing game last night at the Oval. But it sort of feels like some very important pieces are falling into place now with England. Stokes um, literally broke the England record yesterday. Uh, Wokes looked brilliant yesterday with a new ball. He sort of carried on from where he left off in the Ashes. Um, and you sort of assume that, yeah, Bairstow and Root are short and runs, but that's not that's very unlikely to be a long term problem once the tournament actually begins. It's actually yeah. it, it's it's starting to look pretty good for England. Yeah, and, and and in keeping with the way that sort of England have, have gone about it, they've been they've not panicked at all. I mean, remember that leading into the sort of the World T Twenty last year. I mean, obviously they were keen to sort of play it down as to how the chances of winning the tournament. 
I felt that they were they were the best team in it before it started and and, and ended up winning the thing. Um, but they kind of they they won't be rushed. You know, Josh Butler sat out the whole seven match series in Pakistan. You know, they kind of they they, they hold their nerve. Um, when everyone else is sort of going, oh, look, they're, they're playing. How many games have they played? These guys are much better prepared than us. They've kind of sort of eased themselves in so that by the time they hit the tournament proper, they're kind of champing at the bit to go as opposed to kind of, you know, on the on the wrong side of the curve, having peaked a little bit early. Now, it's a, it's a risky business because it, it's not always, you're not always going to get it 100% right. Um, but you're quite right. In, in terms of the amount of 50 over cricket that they've played is hardly any. Um, you know, and but and they're also leaving out most of the, the well, nearly all of the, of the what are potentially the, the fifteen going on the plane to play the three Ireland internationals at the back end of the summer, which again you could look at and go, well, that's crazy. You know, surely you want to get your combinations together and, and and put them put them out on the park as often as possible. But once again, they've decided no, we we know what we're doing. We're quite happy with where we are. We shift our preparation to subcontinental conditions beforehand. That's going to be more indicative of, of the way that the World Cup is going to go. So for now, we'll, we'll use some players um, and, and have a look at some players who are on the undercard who might well be, you know, the, the, the generation that go for the next four-year cycle after this one's done. And who is anybody to, to sort of say, well, they, they, they've got it wrong. You know, they've, they've, won, they've won two World Cups in a row, albeit in, in different formats. England have been remarkably terrible at 50 over cricket and, and, <laughs> and limited overs cricket up until this point. Uh, this is the way these guys have decided to do it, starting with Owen and now with, with Martin Butler. And um, and good luck to them. I hope it works. Yeah, it's beginning to look quite good. Cheers to your time, Butch. Catch you next week. Phil, it's the morning after the night before here at the Oval. Um you were here for yet another Ben Stokes masterclass, 182 of 124, nine sixes, England's highest ever score in ODI cricket, the second highest ever ODI score from number four. It just feels classic Stokes, three games into his return, uh, you know, a few weeks after reconsidering the format, entering its head. I mean, yesterday he, he talked in the, in the press conference about how um, he forgot how many overs there were in the middle of an, <laughs> of an ODI. Uh, he, was, he was just phenomenal. Everything he does is a flex, isn't it? <laughs> Everything he does is is one step ahead. Uh, he will know. He'll intuit the, the you know the slight murmurs around the rightness or otherwise of his return, his unretirement. He will know, of course, about the energy for Harry Brook and others, and so on and so on. Um, he's addressed it himself. He will also have understood that he's been miscast or mischaracterized as a kind of elder statesman like figure now to come in and play steady you know slow burn cricket as the sort of the fulcrum in the team um it's a mis misrepresentation really uh based perhaps on his almost quaintly average and underwhelming t20 story um, I had a look yesterday, actually. He's now hit 200, I think 247, or it might be 248 international sixes, of which something like 25 in the last month or something ri ridiculous. But only 20 of those sixes have been have been hit in T20Is. And obviously his IPL record is pretty poor. And so people have fallen into the trap of thinking, oh, well, you know, he's a different kind of player. He really he expresses himself in test cricket, but in white ball cricket, He's, he's, you know, he's a bit stodgy and he's, he's maybe yesterday's man. And he'd have known this bollocks. He'd have, he'd have sensed it because he's always one step ahead. Uh, and so, you know, 13 for two, two and a bit overs in. He played within himself in the first game for a, what, 69 ball, 50 odd. And yesterday started skittishly. And after that was just brutish. And it was... It was just a statement. It was an announcement, wasn't it? Mm. Um, Joe, I thought it was quite interesting that after their loss at Cardiff, where they scratched around to a below par total and off, they were 55 for five for the Aegeus Bowl. Uh, Butler was sort of preaching the gospel of, of Ben and Bad, saying they needed to go harder when the bowlers were on top. And as Phil said, they were 13 for two yesterday. And Stokes coming in was almost the perfect man for that situation, if that's the message you want to have as a team. Do you think that... W four might actually be the best place for Stokes in ODI cricket and he'll get to stamp his authority on games earlier in a way. He's he's not actually had to do that much in his career up to now. Yeah, I think it's a position that really suits him and really suits the team. I just looked up his, his stats. So he'd only batted nine times at number four before yesterday, averaging 50 now, obviously, when you get 180-odd, <laughs> that 
that helps. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's the perfect role. I think he can play both ways. I think you know what he did yesterday. He won't necessarily be able to do on on certain pitches against certain attacks in the World Cup, and that's fine. The fact he can go either way uh, is huge for England. And, and this, this feeling Root hasn't yet come to the party. I know we've had a few questions coming in about whether his con- his back of form is concerned. Personally, for me, not really at this stage. I think he, he knows what he's doing. Um, but that that Root Stokes Butler three four five, who we've just stuck on the cover of the latest issue of the magazine nicely done joe alongside mo and ali as well but that three four five that that feels like the heart of this this team um and stokes has shown if there was any doubts at all which there should never have been whether he was you know it was right to bring him back to this world cup he's obviously ended those doubts in um, some style just briefly on stokes i was it me and ben were at training the day before here here at the oval for some reason and stokes batted slightly reluctantly right at the end of the net session and was rubbish, you know, couldn't hit it at all. He clearly bit bothered by his knee again, and he was skewing it and missing it and whacking it up in the air. Uh, he's a bad net player anyway, so he's like a famously bad net player. But at the same time, as it, as, as it was winding down, Joe Root was over the other side of the ground with one of the coaches. I didn't actually know who it was, and he was the coach was feeding him balls in and around his, his chest area, and he was working hard on the pull shot. And he was getting a bit cranky with himself because he's such a perfectionist. And even though he's only, you know, okay, now three binary scores in a row, but it doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things, as Joe's quite rightly pointed out. But he was still working a couple of things out, I think, in his head. And he's not entirely at ease, I don't think, Joe, just at the moment, which is not in any way a grand statement. It's just it was interesting to watch how they how they go about it, you know, and, and Root's perfectionism was was evident that the day before and Stokes's innate reluctance to, to, to knock about and in the phony war of a net the day before was also pretty, pretty mm. showing. Also, when we talk about format, when we're, we're more than two months away from the World Cup final, <laughs> no one is going to be able to be in form now, maintain that form all the way through and then perform in the final. Really, there are going to be like peaks and troughs. So I, I've, yeah, that's why I've got no concerns mm. about Rui. So although there is maybe a suggestion that he should play in that island series if he fancies it i mean he knows his game better than anyone but you know if he wants to get some 50 over professional cricket under his belt then maybe that is the way to go they might possibly be thinking about that for jason roy as well i don't know what their departure plans and how that ties in together but those two it now feels a, maybe a little bit strange the that if they do want to hit and maybe they don't that they don't get included in that island mm. squad ben what, what do you think about that use of the island, island series three games uh Three ODI, the last three full ODIs that England play before the World Cup. Only I think none of the World Cup squad at the moment are in the squad for the Ireland series. Do, do you think it? You would you be tempted to, to play Root and Roy, etc.? Yeah, I would. And I suppose the other odd thing in terms of departure times is that Brooke, it's assumed, will still be will either be a backup or involved. But even if he is just a backup, he is in that Ireland series, and he will then fly off. So I don't think there should be a, a barrier from that point of view. And, and yeah, Root, Root, I'm not as worried about Roy. Roy I mean, as you just discussed with Birch later, uh, there is a question over his form. And so he is almost more likely to want to go and, you know, get some runs just to show, you know, that he's Jason Roy, basically. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be I'd be pretty comfortable with that. But I guess there is a sense with this team that it's not just, you know, individual players figuring out how to play their cricket again. It, it, it is the whole team, really. And that Cardiff loss, it was one that I can't remember England having had really since 2015 of that of that sort. Like... They have obviously they've lost games and they have got under par scores and they have misjudged conditions. But it's rare that they have kind of left stuff in the tank in the way that they did there. I know that, you know, uh, it, it required, a re- required a recovery and judging pitch is a, is a difficult one. But even I was just trying to think maybe the Champions Trophy semi-final in 2017 was similar where England got to 211, almost basti out of the overs. But that was actually guys getting in and then getting getting out and scratching around and then Pakistan kind of making a, a mockery of conditions when they batted whereas this just seemed like yeah it was it was old school style ODI cricket which is what England have, have, have so rarely done and uh but yeah as Joe says and as is true when you look back through World Cups it's so rare for a team to go through it completely flawless and if England can take you know a few games to you know if they can muddle through the group stages as they did kind of in, in 2019 as well uh that will um that that that's fine. It's just about getting to those semi-finals, and if you can find you know, everything along the way, almost like the World Cup. Part of that is so long as is the World Cup prep, really. Just just on on that, obviously we'll 
do this a lot more in the next few weeks, but England's last four games, three of them are big games. They've got the Netherlands in there with, with all due respect, but they've got Australia, India and Pakistan in the final four. And they also go all over the country as well. You know, they play, I think, at eight different venues. They yeah. play Ahmedabad twice, I think. Perhaps they might play at Lucknow twice, but... I think it is eight venues. Is it eight? I, th- I thought it was. They play at Dharamsala and Lucknow and Pune. They play all over the Maybe it'll be place. eight if they get to the semi-finals and final, possibly. But I think, yeah, the potential right. to play at eight stadiums across six weeks. So, eight, exactly. Geographically, as well as, obviously, pitches, conditions, overheads, etc. So... Um, the more you think about it, the more you can understand why they've picked a very um, a squad that spreads its talents to to every corner of what you what you can look for, right? Because they recognise, I think, that some pitches are going to demand swing, some pitches are going to turn big, other pitches are going to be flat as you can get, and and so you can understand their thinking. Um, and again, we'll talk about it a lot, lot more down the line, but I think the strategy of how to go about it will be interesting out there because. In India, in 50 over cricket, if you take India, if they're 50 for naught off 12, they're fine with that in Indian conditions. In England, if you're English, you're tearing your hair out if you're 50 for naught after 12. So it's going to be interesting to see how they end up going about it out there. Uh, um, And what we saw yesterday, that sort of spectacular, sort of old school statement, Morgan era statement, we go hard, then we go a bit harder and then a bit harder again. Um, can you do it out in India to, to that extent? It, it's going to be interesting mm. to see. And I think that is their, that's the dilemma that they face. Uh, talking about um, if, it, if it swings, I thought Chris Wokes was amazing yesterday, oh. carrying on exactly from where he left off at the, the same ground against Latham Australia. Was, was beauty, brilliant. It? They got what, one to move away from him and the next one to jag back in. Um, Phil mentioned Stokes' six hitting. So I was looking this up yesterday. Stokes now hit 25 sixes in international cricket this summer from just nine matches and he remember he doesn't play t20s anymore and i was looking up uh, who has the record for the most sixes in an english international summer any guesses um there's one guy who's way out in front english player. english english player both of them in 85 no nope. flint off Pe- peterson 05 Flint off 2004, 2004. Was it? 2004 right. 37 <laughs> sixes in 2004, including 18 in a month against West Indies. And then he had the Champions Trophy at the end of the summer and he got 100 against Sri Lanka. We got like five or six. Yeah, because he hit that 160 odd at Edgbaston and his dad caught him. Do you know yeah, this? Dad caught him in the crowd. Yeah. Dad caught him in the crowd, deep yeah. mid wicket. And I think, I can't remember who he's batting. It might be Gary Jones, maybe, but he t- turns to his partner and he points out, he says, That's my dad. <laughs> he's taking him. Well, just on Flintoff, by the yeah. way, him being here, what you know, what a heartening thing that was. Mm. Sort of jarring to see the physical consequences of that horrific accident that he went through, but simultaneously as well, you know, really heartening to see that he's, if you like, back in his safe place. You know, Rob Keys had a had a had a, a smart move That's there a great just to bring him in. Yeah. What, what a, a mentoring know. role. I mean, you know, but sure. it just works for just everyone, lovely. doesn't it? It's when you lovely. hear David Willey talking about. You know, feeling 100 feet tall because Flintoff's just said he likes what he's doing with his bowling. <laughs> Obviously, it's a great thing for, for Flintoff as well to be kind of getting back in the mix yeah. after a horrible, horrible accident. He was on the mitt to Wokes, Atkinson and Jofra, and he didn't lay a mitt on Jofra. Just nowhere near it. Nowhere near it. And Wokes, he didn't have to move a muscle. He just stood there. Just went, <laughs> boom. Into the glove, boom! Into the glove. How did Archer and Atkinson's pace compare? I know it's not really a fair test of warm up, but how did they? Uh, look in terms I of wasn't. Pace? To be honest, I couldn't tell you for sure, but I was only really watching Jofra. I was fascinated to see how he was going, and to the to my eye, he looked in good nick. But he didn't bowl many deliveries. He only only bowled maybe four or five balls. I saw across the half hour he was out there, and then switched some left arm spin, and then bowled some lovely left arm spin. Um, Harry Brook bowled a lot of off breaks with Moeen Ali at one end and Adil Rashid at the other. Bowled a half hour's worth of off breaks. Just putting it out there. Right. Okay. Him, him and Stokes from, from both ends in India. Um, David asks, please explain the back foot no ball. Also, what other obscure thing which hardly ever happens does Ben wish would happen in a match? So you can tell us about the law. Ben, over to you. There's a very, very long check yesterday for a back foot no ball when Glenn Phillips dismissed Joss Butler. Uh, what was going on there? Yeah, well, I think the law itself is perhaps slightly vague. Um, It says that the back foot must land within and not touching the return crease. Uh, And that's taken to mean 
that the first point of contact the foot makes with the ground must be the bit that's on the ground must be obviously inside and not touching that white line at all so you can, can have your foot in the air over the line uh and uh it doesn't match if it sort of cuts across it after that I, like within to me i think that that could be interpreted to mean if the air if the back foot is up, up in the air over the line that's not really within but that that's that's what that's interpreted to mean so the right decision was reached a marginal one but that's fair enough and you see it actually quite often if you think of a bowler's foot landing and then kind of like dragging back across the line and that's not a back foot no ball so that's fine and they, they came to the right decision uh, any other laws that you wish you saw more often well to be honest the one is the uh which was the one in the afghanistan uh sri lanka game last week when it came down to the, the net run rate situation and you had the the scenario i'm not going to get into the whole thing but the weird thing was was that on the third ball of the 38th over it would have been beneficial for Sri Lanka to just start bowling deliberate wides because if they had, if Afghanistan surpassed that by one run, then Sri Lanka would have been through to the next round. If Afghanistan hit a six at that point, Afghanistan would have been through to the next round. That's good, Gardner. Yeah. That's but, peak stuff. But but the bit, the bit, the law that I would actually like to change, you, I don't think you can outlaw deliberate wides because we quite like deliberate wides sometimes, right? Do like we like a, them? Yeah, well, when a batter comes down the pitch and a bowler fires it in down the leg side, and then the that's keeper true. takes it and yeah, stops it. That's so true. That, that's a different wide, and we like those. So what I would change is that <laughs> if if a game is won uh, with an extra, you just add uh, with, you know, with, with a noble or a wide, you add five runs. Uh, yeah, five runs onto the total at that point. So it's as if the game was won with a six because that would uh, take out any sort of uh, manipulation at that point. Have the MCC ever asked you to be a consultant? Because you did sort of get a law changed or amended uh, last year. Uh, no, but I mean, I, I, jo Johnny Singer is uh, an MCC Laws advisor and he's very approachable and often explains things to me that I don't fully understand about the laws. I refuse but, yeah. to believe that. <laughs> but what, I think you're explaining things to him no, that he no, doesn't no, understand. No. There, there have definitely been cases, oh, I'm sure I what the one was recently, uh, maybe I'll remember it by the end of the There's podcast. There's definitely going to be a Ben's Law in there <laughs> yeah, yeah. before <laughs> this Far Farago is done. But probably. It already kind of is. Like He was the one who, who got them to change the definition of, of, of uh, what when the arm is at a vertical for a man cat or something mm. like that. Anyway, the benefits um, of an Oxbridge education. What a, le what a legacy! <laughs> <laughs> um, as, as we mentioned, England are playing Ireland soon. There are three uncapped players in that squad: batters Sam Hain and Jamie Smith, and the fast bowler George Scrimshaw. Zach Crawley will captain the side. Um, before we move on, he's going to play loads of white ball cricket. Who? Zach sorry, Crawley. Zach Crawley. Yeah, for England. Yeah, loads of it. Um, he had a good week as well. He's got 150 in the county championship. Um, That'd be great as well. Sorry, Craw Crawley captaining. Roy and Root, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, Joe, before we move move on, um, how do you assess New Zealand? Um, other than maybe uh, in the second game, I'm, I'm not sure if they picked their strongest 11 at any point and they've got Williamson to come in. They've got to the last two World Cup finals and, and naturally no one's really talking about them this time. Uh, how well placed do you think they are to have a dart at the trophy? Um, about as well as ever. They look a little bit iffy, not quite as good as the big sides, and they'll almost certainly get to the semi-finals. Despite that, uh, Williamson, lots of positive noises about him being fit potentially for the start of the tournament, which is huge for them. They're definitely missing a, a top quality batter in in their lineup. Bowling was obviously a bit of a concern yesterday; wasn't their first choice attack. Uh, but great news for them that Trent Bolt is is flying. Uh, obviously, hasn't been part of the international setup because he's chosen to essentially become a freelancer but yeah he's still he's still absolutely the key for them uh glenn phillips has added a bit of power to their middle order which they were kind of lacking in 2019 um they played a very kind of traditional attritional style of 50 over cricket in 2019 it looks like they're a bit more adaptable mitchell um can hit big as well but only against england <laughs> only against england yeah um Nisham can long handle it as and well. Nisham of course who's not here because he's he's back home for the birth of his child so th so there is there is power in there they're definitely not the most powerful lineup but you know if I was to have a punt I think they'll probably come fifth or maybe fourth very much in in touch with the semi-finals uh winning it feels a stretch but it probably did before the last tournament as well and they came quite close I seem to recall I guess I guess the form of, of Williamson is pretty key right I mean he, he might be back involved but can he just resume as you know as player of the tournament last time? Uh, if he if he can resume that 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 does not not transform the side because it's already a very good side, but that can be the missing link that takes that from being a good side that contenders to actually real sort of uh, like 
real front runners, I think. Ahead of the World Cup starting in three weeks' time, we are going to be looking back at vintage moments of World Cups gone by. And we'll be doing this uh, with Lathwaite wines and, and try and pair some of our favourite moments with some, some of their stunning wines. Uh, for our first vintage moment, it only... Is this going to happen fitting. every week? Yeah. We have to drink on the show. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Uh, for our first vintage moment, it seems only fitting that we revisit the 2019 World Cup final, that famous Sunday in July that will live long in the memory. It is therefore fitting that the bottle of Lathwaite's wine we are going to crack open is a Sunday Bay Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Sunday Bay is a Kiwi Sauvignon, which makes it even more fitting. Uh, it is uh, Lathwaite's most popular style, and the Sunday Bay is one of the highest rated wines on their site, as well as the one that is reordered the most. Uh, you can expect exuberant grapefruit and grassy nettle character with a bright citrus zip. You've definitely um, written that yourself, haven't you? Absolutely. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah no, um, I've got some over here. Very zesty. And, and ju- uh, just as Joe's nicked my my uh, glass, uh, just <laughs> just for the record, listeners, it is ten forty five a.m. Uh, we've just cracked open. Uh, I was going to say, bottle. should we shift these back a couple of hours so we can well, really I, enjoy I was just the wine? Say, we do two a day. I was just going. <laughs> I was just going to. Uh, these are the kind of sacrifices we make for the listeners uh, cracking over a bottle of wine at 10 15 in the morning this is it they say i would um, say this is a good morning wine if there's such a thing though <laughs> <laughs> also we, we went to print last night didn't we, yeah. we, we, oh, we went yeah. to press last night you know we, we've well earned this um phil the 2019 world cup final happy memories yeah sort yeah yeah sort of um slightly pained at certain points um, it's just sort of snippets now of memories. Um, the thing I remember being in, in the press box and basically scre- everyone had lost their shit, obviously, but I, I was screaming at Stokes for why he didn't hit the full toss out the ground. Uh, and can you imagine him doing that now? Probably sort of, not. Sort of, sort of well, well, I don't know because there was, there was probably, there was cold hard logic to it. I would think as he's explained. Do, do people know about this explanation? So he'd watched a um a Bangladesh the highlights of a Bangladesh India game I think not long before this game. Uh, sorry, he'd watched the highlights long before this game, uh, in which Bangladesh they'd hit a two they'd gone one four four with eleven needs to win off the last over. So by that point they need two of the last three, and I think Mushfiqur Rahim visibly celebrates after the second boundary, which fires up the India. They then lose three wickets in a row. Yeah. I think Alder catches on the boundary, and Stokes thinks, well, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna tie it up i'm not gonna you know fall hitting it to the guy on the boundary when i can just get the single and maybe run two yeah and you assume that the ball's going to be block hole it's you know as it was it was a leg side full toss but the, the thinking was good but my thinking wasn't and obviously i'd completely lost any sense of perspective and proportion by that point so i remember just just running around the press box screaming at the top of my voice you know why has he done that fazia mohammed style you know um, as ever, I was wrong. Um, I remember giving it up uh, when Morgan slapped one up in the air and they were five down. I thought, well, you know, on that stodgy pitch with the pressure, we are fated never to win this thing, and that's that. Um, so I'd given that up. We were actually watching that on the on the nursery ground area on the big screen, and Felix was there, and one or two others. Anderson was there as well. Um, so yeah, I'd given that one up completely, and then obviously it happened, and then I remember me and Joe. Uh, slipping into the MCC library to do a podcast with Felix as, you know, night descended on the place. Quite hoarse by that point. Yeah, we? and pissed. And uh, well, that, that episode will be available on our current podcast. Probably feed. is. It, no, was it, it definitely is, yeah. So Obviously, we didn't yeah. have, you know, Parky dri- driving the show. And so it was just me and Joe. <laughs> Um, throughout Matt, that Matt, tournament, Matt, Matt terrifying, Matt, really. Matt was playing for, for I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite arrived. I was loose, not as... Joe was probably slightly less loose, but still loose, and and Felix was basically just. Well, crying. I, no, I was. I hadn't. I wasn't working at all that day, so I was. Yeah, technically, I was. I was actually doing something. <laughs> oh, you're you're an excellent piece of the website, which Did is I? also still there. Yeah. Did I? Yeah. Oh, well, well done. It's <laughs> not about me. Um, yeah. I remember feeling uh, sick in the run chase. Like uh, I still have nightmares of that Colin de Grandom spell. Ten overs, <laughs> one for twenty-five. And the most remember, economical ever in a World Cup final. Do you I remember think. how bad Root was? Yeah. It's a seven he says himself it's his worst knock yeah. ever for England. And I remember when, when Butler got out and a, a hill I'm, I'm willing to die on is, is that Butler's contribution in that final was more significant 
than Stokes because he was the one who was who was actually maintaining the run rate mm. that was required, and also in the super over was 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 more important as well. Um, the other thing yeah, about when, the, I, when he got out, I thought England had no chance. The odd thing that kind of sticks in my brain from that day, counterintuitively, is is how flat it was earlier on in the day because there was a lot of Indian fans with Indian shirts on who'd expected their side to be there. Obviously, New Zealand beat them in the semis, and Lords does often have like quite a flat feel to it. That was only kind of enhanced by the fact that it was a very sticky wicket there was some not great cricket it was quite old school 50 over cricket for a lot of it it wasn't a great match and it, oddly you kind of forget that bit because we know how it ends so you kind of like you know re-remember stuff in in a way that wasn't necessarily accurate but it was it, actually for a lot of that day it wasn't a great game and also it felt like New Zealand were well short so I think at the at the, at the interval it was like well England are probably bought this really i think that was the prevailing thought and then first ball of the second innings bolt thinks he has root mm. is it uh, roy roy yeah. sorry roy yeah sorry, roy bolt thinks he has roy and then is it reviewed it's given out and then reviewed or new zealand review it and it's not successful i think the former but i remember that's it, it no sorry it is the former because no sorry it's the latter because if it had been given out, it would have stayed out because oh, it was, one of those. Yeah. It was okay. hitting leg stump, but yeah. it was umpire's decision. So at that point, I think certainly I was like, all right, well, actually, we do have a proper game on here. Um, but it, it wasn't in some ways, even though it's the sort of most famous World Cup match in history, in a lot of ways, it wasn't a vintage game mm. at all. And that almost gets kind of forgotten because of, of the way it all ended up. The, that over, the, it was Bolt to Stokes, wasn't it? When Stokes managed to, sweep a low full toss for six and he had just no right to play that shot it was that far off being the perfect unplayable block hole yorker and that over when he he opened up and that particular shot that that's the the icon shot to me from that from that game that's mm. the one where he simply had no right to do it and mitch santa's leave mm. as well last ball the, the last dump, ball of the yeah, innings. yeah. Yeah, Shocker. I don't think anyone's going to do that in a World Cup final ever again. Um, um, w word to my mate Gregors, right, who bought tickets that cost about six or seven hundred quid for him and two friends from one of the so-called reputable ticket sites. Uh, he'd been talking to the bloke on text message, um, turned up, paid the money, paid all the money, turned up at the ground, waited, waited again, called the number, no number, deadline. So yeah, that was that was a hit, that was a hit for him. When I did meet up with up with him after the game, uh, he drowned his sorrows, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I think we we will be doing well to get a uh, to get a final finish uh, like that ever again, let alone this time round. Also, Nisham six in the in the in the Super Over. You thought that, thought that was that really, mm. you know? And what a shot under pressure as well, because Butler and Stokes were sort of crabbing around desperately and clothing it and scampering. Nisha played beautifully, didn't he? And at that point, I think they needed three from two. Mm. And, and then, Ar and then Ar you think it's done? And then Archer's bravery as well to to stick to Yorkers and and, and Bumpers oh, yeah. and yeah. Uh, as a reminder, uh, if you enjoy the sound of any of the wines that we we that we drink across the four weeks, they are available at Lathwaite. And don't forget your twenty five percent off when you buy six or more bottles uh, with code Wisdom at checkout. Is this mine now, Yaz? Can I just keep this? Uh, you, you go for it. Um, the Asia Cup has been happening. India look really good. They thumped Pakistan and overcame Sri Lanka when conditions were against them. So they basically batted on what was effectively a day three pitch. And then due meant that when they bowled themselves, it was it was much less spin friendly. Um, ben, Boomer has only bowled 12 overs since he's returned to ODI cricket, or well, in, in this Asia Cup at least. He was amazing against both Pakistan and Sri Lanka. He's only taken three wickets so far. And you feel that with him fit, it's a big if because he's not played that much cricket recently, they are going to be the team to beat. Yeah, it's kind of all coming together from the right time. I mean, not quite as big as Brimmer coming back, but Kara Hall being back in that mix as well, that just uh, that's another banker in that uh, in that top four now, if he does bat at number four. And whereas they had a bankable top three before, a bankable top four is, you know, it's one more player. That's 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 significant. Uh, and yeah, but Brimmer has been uh, everything that that Bumrah was before this this long injury layoff, and if he can stay fit throughout a whole World Cup, then that is that'll be very very difficult to beat. Also, Kuldeep Yadav has been exceptional. I think he took nine wickets in in two days because they played that Pakistan chase on the on the reserve day. Um, and yeah, they look 
they look really, really, really good. The only thing I'd say about the Pakistan game is that Pakistan chose not to bowl Harris Ralph because he had a bit of a niggle and he's now not going to play, I think, unlike to play the rest of the Edge Cup, not playing today. But then if you look at the players who have come in, who will likely come into the team today, um, Pakistan, there is a drop off there. So that is their their weaknesses in the, the pace bowling in particular and a bit in the in the top four as well in the in the second string, whereas India have, you know, they, as we said before, they play so much cricket that those reserves are good, but the first team is a, are unreal. And yeah, that top yeah. five of what Rohit, Gill, Kohli, Rahul, Kishan, Pandya, Jadeja. That is really Bloody good. Hell. And the, then, <laughs> the, the blend of experience, players at their peak, new superstar in Gill, players are in form. Like there's a chat that Rohit might not be in form, but he's averaging 50 and striking 100 this year. Um, and then Jadeja and Pandya at six and seven. I think that that, that is going to be an extremely hard our, team to beat. We did our predictions for the magazine, which I imagine will go online as well in a week or so. And you picked out Pandya as your star of the show prediction. And I think it's a really good shout, actually. He's a, He's a mega star cricketer and it feels like it's his time, right? He's prime about the same of, age as Stokes was in 2019, yeah. Home World Cup. He's, he has the charisma yeah. and the presence and the ego to pull it off. Um, just on, but I watched that spell against Pakistan. They had the best of conditions, uh, but he's a genius. I asked Wokes here a couple of days ago, who's who's the best white ball bowler then? And he said, it's just no question. Bumrah is is on a different level, and he sort of politely mentioned a few others, but mm. he said what he can do with his wrist and his control uh, of movement uh, with with that white ball. He says there's no one else like him. Mm. But Bumrah is quietly the, the the player of this time, right? Like he, I think he's the only cricketer in the world right now who gets into a world eleven in all three in all three formats. Um, and if you think about his effect on India's Test team, okay, they didn't quite get the results maybe they should have, but he comes in in that South Africa tour in 2018. They win the third game of that series. Then they go to Australia and win there twice. They come to England, take a 2-1 lead, don't finish it off. Uh, but he has, he transformed that team, turning from the team that was dominant at home, still struggling away to being, you know, the best team in the world, almost across conditions, even if they didn't get the World's Championship show for it. And uh, he is, you know, a, an ODI and T20 bowler, a distance above the rest. I thought it was quite telling, actually, just just on that. Um, Morgan was was talking about um, when when Archer became available for England in 2019, and he said that the thing that was missing for England at that time is they didn't have a bowler who could confidently you could confidently give the ball to in all three phases. And I think Boomer is one of the very very few bowlers in the world who is just brilliant whenever you give him the ball. Um, yeah, in, India for me are definitely the, the team to beat. It feels like there are quite a few that a lot of the leading nations certainly Australia. India, England, their sides are going to look very, very different almost immediately after the World Cup. I think there'll be a lot of retirements after the World Cup and it tends to work in cycles. Also, what's the incentive to play 50 over cricket for the next four years if you're not going to play in the World Cup or if you, if you don't think you can play in the next World Cup? So, you know, of, of the last decade of missing out on World Trophies, it feels like if India are to miss out this time, this will hurt more than the rest. Obviously, it's an, a home soil. You've got this side that uh, should be basically at their peak. It's a row it maybe a little bit past that. Coley possibly a bit past it, but still phenomenal. Uh, it's kind of now or never for them. Um, and uh, yeah, I think a lot of us in those predictions picked Shubman Gill for a for a big tournament. Mm. Uh, yeah, he's he's. I think him or Baba for leading run score would be my my shout. And also, I think Ben's right to pick out Kuldeep Yadav. This is a guy who not that long ago was completely out of the picture. I, think, I don't think he was even getting into his IPL side. Um, and also, just that they have the flexibility as well. So depending on pitches. They can have Axar Patel at eight if they think it's going to spin and Shardle at eight if they think it's going to do do lots for the seamers. So they, they do feel like they just have lots of bases to co- covered. Um, there was a really good game between India and Sri Lanka, actually. And the, the star of that game was a 20-year-old called Dunith Walalaga, um, who was the under-19 captain for Sri Lanka last year. He took a fifer and then scored 45 not out with the bat to almost take them home. Um, and Ben Sri Lanka, depending on the pitches, could be... I don't think they'll qualify for the semi-finals, but I think depending on the surfaces that they come across, I can see them um, playing e- an even bigger role in in determining who ends up in the top four than they did in 2019. Because they've got, since in 2019, they've almost got a new bowling attack. Um, Pathirana plays for CSK, so does Tikshana, 
Hasaranga's really good and, and, and as is Will Oliga. Yeah, I suppose on that bowling attack, the question really is how good can Tikshana and Hasaranga be against the top teams in the world? Their records, when you look at them, they, they, that is not, not to say that they've never bowled well against the good teams, but they are skewed by performances against, you know, the, the, the lower ranked teams in world cricket. And you can kind of see why a bit when you watch them, because they're really hard or that, yeah, they, they turn the ball both ways. They're hard to pick. And if you haven't faced that kind of bowler before, as you might not have at a lower level, then you might struggle. Whereas, you know, guys who are playing for the likes of England, India, they they have faced these types of guys before and they know how to handle them. But if but I still think, especially Teak Shana, to be honest, even though Hasaranga is the one who gets more of the headlines, I look at him and I think actually that's just a just a really good bowler as well mm. as one who has these these tricks up his sleeve. And if he can figure out a way to, you know, to be effective even when guys know what's happening as he bowls it I think he might be able to do that and if he can then yeah they become a team that can disrupt some of the some of the the, the favorites for the tournament I guess mm. um Phil what's your moment of the week will you judge me if I have another glass of wine not at all I'm really regretting that I couldn't sort at this point Phil there's, there's no judgment is there really <laughs> you don't fancy just swinging from the bottle yes uh might get there felt like a rhetorical one. question Joe <laughs> yeah a little bit there we go Sorry, yes. What were you saying? What's your moment of the week, other than uh, the, um, the complimentary wine? At I interviewed my new my new favourite cricketer, Travis Head. I don't have any great insights. Sorry, uh, I interviewed him on Zoom, uh, and he was just totally, exceptionally, impeccably lovely. Uh, did you tell him that you thought he was pants not so long ago? I didn't mention. <laughs> I thought he was crap uh, once upon a time, and that. He's no one's idea of a of a test match number five. <laughs> I didn't and that was say your tip that. for leading run score in the World Cup. I didn't say that, but it was yeah, yeah, I have, yeah. His record in the last couple of years in fifty over cricket is outstanding. Yeah. He's hitting hundred and twenty and averages sixty one. Uh opens the back now, of course. Um, um he also he, bowled he really great. well the other day as well. Yeah. He bowled a ten well in, in the ashes for like here and four, there. 40 odd. And you think that um, depending on the balance that Australia go with, he he could end up bowling a lot of overs. And as you say, he's new to newish to ODI cricket, but he's been brilliant for a couple of years now. Yeah, I didn't pay enough attention to him when he was a young player. To be honest, it was a name that you saw around, but I didn't really register. He he made his debut at eighteen for South Australia. He was a prodigy kid and was captain at twenty one of South Australia and. And then has been captain on and off since then. But he spent most of his 20s sort of dragging his career through the grinder and his technique, questioning a lot of it. And one thing he said that struck me, uh, I said, so what did you work on? What were the issues? And he says, well, my forward defence, mate. My forward defence was all over the place for years. He said hitting the ball, scoring runs was never an issue. Hitting boundaries was never an issue, but staying in long enough was a problem. And he said, after years of theorising and working at it, the more overtly extravagantly attacking he became the more his defense improved and he says he puts it down to the feet the feet were just moved more into the ball because you're looking to hit attack the ball you need to hit the ball and so then the body g comes with it and the feet start to move rather than being tentative and thinking that you need to play from the crease mm. uh that mindset switch had the knock-on effect of actually improving his defensive technique which is obviously sounds counterintuitive but scrape away and there's this, this, this sort of perverse sort of logic to it right mm. uh, anyway we only chatted for 20 minutes or so never met him before uh delightful delightful geezer my new favorite cricketer he was uh i like the way he spoke about the ashes series as well talking about the kind of the body line barrage that he got uh, I don't know if he was joking or not, but when he was saying he was netting without pads at one stage because he was... I think just, he was serious, I, yeah. I, I assumed he was serious, but I couldn't tell from... Just because he was... That was all he was getting in the matches. So why would you warm up with anything else? Yeah. So he'd be not out. Players would walk in, you know, Cameron Green, Carey, and say, so what's it doing? He said, I don't, I don't fucking know, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that Australia side, by the way, it's kind of extraordinary. I don't think people have realised that they are... They're kind of more attacking than like, well, okay, this is based on the last five games they played in South Africa, but they're more attacking than England were leading up to 2019, basically. And their side is also more, like that England side had lots of all rounds in it. This is more skewed than that. But, but are they going to have all rounders when everyone's fit? Because they've not been playing their first choice bowling attack. So they'll have Cummins, Stark, Hazelwood, Zampa. That's true. That's true. But I guess, I guess maybe they're trying to imbue a sense of attacking freedom uh, in this series. I mean, if you go through the the games they've had, okay, the T20Is, they scored 226 batting first in the first game, 
chased on 165 in less than 15 overs in the second game, and then chased on 191 in less than 18 overs in the third game. Then they go extraordinarily hard chasing 223 in the first ODI. They're 113 for seven after 16.3 overs. So that's scoring at more than run a ball when you're seven down. Then Labuschagne comes in as concussion sub and sort of sees them home. Then they score almost 400 in the third game and then go really, really hard chasing quite a big total in the fourth game and then kind of fall on their faces. But they, at the moment, they're batting really deep and they are attacking like a team that knows they have lots in reserve. And I guess... I think they're well in this tournament. Well in it. Another one that I was surprised. I knew Adam Zampa was a much improved cricketer, but I was looking at his record over the last few years while we were putting together our World Cup preview. And it's unbelievably good, really. So 66 wickets in 31 matches at 20 uh, since the 2019 World Cup. Economy of under five. I mean, that's actually, that puts him, that puts him up there as like the best spinner in the tournament. Uh, yeah, I think it probably, it has to rank obviously brilliantly in the qualifier recently, but against weaker opposition up, and up to that point, hadn't done great in 50 over cricket. Whereas Zampa's been doing that against, he, he helped them to a series win in India early this year. It took five, I think, in Chennai or four or five in Chennai to, to win in that series. So in the past, you've thought maybe Australia's spin options let them down in subcontinent. I think this time they've actually got one of the best spinners in the world in, in the format. Yeah, it's great. So Tan- Tanvir Sanga made his debut in, in one of the ODIs and uh, they were comparing him to Zampa. And in a lot of the punch, he was basically saying that Zampa's line is just impeccable. He just doesn't give any wits. So first of all, that means that there are fewer balls to attack, but also he just gets loads of wickets, bold and as, as Phil's gesturing, bold to players trying to cut it basically because he just doesn't give them anything. Um, and, and as Ben mentioned, Labuschagne scored lots of runs initially as a concussion substitute, which we've seen before and isn't yet in their squad. So potential selection conundrum for them, but a pretty good one to have. A guy, a guy banging form, not in the squad. Uh, and also from that series, Aidan Markham scored his first mm. ever ODI 100 against a full member. How has it taken him this long? Um, I feel another team that looks very good on paper. That South Africa batting lineup, I think, is is better than it was in, in, in 2019. And I think... Um, if they get things right with the ball, they could do really well. Um, got a question for you guys. Um, there have been quite a few games in the last few days where Team A get the massive total and then Team B quite quickly finds themselves five down for not many, which is a consequence, I guess, of teams batting quicker and you have to go really hard from ball one to chase a side uh, who, who scores 360 or whatever. Um, and from a spectacle point of view, viewers know what the result would be hours before the match is done which leaves um a suboptimal spectacle so yesterday for example there was a good two and a half three hours where the result was 100 percent up and you know you had Lockie ferguson at the end uh who who scored five of 17 at the end which, which was quite painful to watch um what, what, what do we make of this I, I almost i almost think that we need uh physical punishments for the losing team so if you lose more than by more than 100 runs Flogging. <laughs> Yeah, get, quite a punchy get, call. Yes, give, give them make make sure they 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 run laps after the game. Braverman in the room. If you, yeah. if you if you lose by more than a hundred runs, but bat for more than thirty five overs, I think there should be there's got to be uh, something something's got to be done because you get a lot of games. Just lock them up. You got a lot of <laughs> a lot of dead dead time in ODI cricket at the moment. Um, I'm not sure how you solve that problem, but you're right. It is. <laughs> painful and it's going to be particularly painful in a world cup where there's going to be a lot of dead rubbers i mean the the format of 10 team world cup everyone plays everyone on the group stage by the end you can be pretty comfortable that the best teams have got through to the semi-finals which is great but there will be some flat games at the end and if they're flat one-sided games that are decided halfway through it's not a great advert for you know the world cup but moreover 50 go over cricket which has got a bad rep at the moment anyway and and yet what is a good score batting first because that like the exact opposite happened in that first England ODI, right? Mm. England got up to totally thought, like, oh, they might be in this here. And then again, within about like, okay, m- maybe you could have convinced yourself if England take three quick wickets, they're back in it. But also that game, as, as well as those two batted, was gone as a spectacle uh, quite a long time before the end. And that was with the team making almost 300. And yet now we're mm. seeing games where a team makes 340, like in that South Africa Australia ODI, and Australia fall flat on their faces. And that's that game done too. So I think this is probably a bit down to just chance and ODI cricket is normally very good and we've had a little bit of a run of and also there have been some very good games in the Asia Cup as yeah. well. But do you not well think T20 teams. cricket has, has stretched that as well that, that you know there are a lot of very bad T20s that are one-sided because someone scores so many runs the other team have to go hard and then they just lose loads of early wickets and it's kind of fine because it's done quickly and then you've got the next T20 the next day that I think that's happening more in 50 over cricket because of the skills that have been brought in from T20 but we have to sit through the rest of it 
in order to kind of just reach the end of a of a game that we already know the result. And of. I was thinking, will net run rate permutations in the World Cup make it better or worse? I think potentially worse for the first half of the tournament because the only you know the, the team cares, but as a spectacle, if a team scores three hundred and eighty and team two are scratching around to get to two seventy five, that is not that is not good watching. Um, on the on your point about the concern that there's going to be dead games towards the end of the group stages. My instinctively, I agree with you, right? And I think that could become a problem. I was having a chat with someone yesterday, though, who sees it the other way for what it's worth. And if you're looking at the components of the 10 teams, the fact that it's being played in Indian conditions perhaps equalizes it a bit for the teams that have less firepower, such as Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, etc. If Af- Afghanistan aren't going to lose nine games, I don't right. think like they did in England last if, time. If it was being played exactly, if it was being played over here, then you'd think, okay, it's probably you know the, the top half a dozen are going to dominate and so on. But perhaps the nature of the conditions might actually balance it up a little bit, and and there there will hopefully be fewer dead games as a consequence because the playing field might be sort of neutralised a little bit. Hopefully, yeah. I, I, there's definitely something in that theory. Yeah. You just don't want a top four to run away in the first five or six rounds of games and then just have seventh playing eighth with nothing really on it. And also, I think in terms of teams will definitely qualify with games to spare for the semi-finals, but you want to finish first or second because you get on paper a slightly easier knockout uh, semi-final game. And I'm looking back at the 2019 World Cup that was the same format. There were a few dead games towards the end, but even the last game was South Africa, Australia. If Australia won that, they would have avoided England in the semi-final, for example. The game before that, India versus Sri Lanka, India had to win that to make sure they finished top, for example. So, I guess, yeah. I think well, England probably, certainly made it exciting, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, uh, I always think with these tournaments as well, Pakistan almost always will make a world tournament interesting because they can beat and lose against in anyone. In whatever way they do it. Yeah. And uh, regardless of how they've been playing up until that point as well. But maybe we do need to put England in that category, actually. Thinking back to the last 350 over World Cups, I mean, England made 2015 interesting by being <laughs> absolutely awful. 2011, they were basically the only side playing good games, weren't they? Like they had the tie against India. They lost to Ireland. Uh, and then obviously... Uh, crash and burned against in South the, Africa as well, didn't they? Yeah, and, and, and then crash and burned in the uh, mm. in the quarters again. But I think I think may, maybe England and Pakistan deserve an equal and New Zealand as well. Yeah, New, Ze- true. New Zealand yeah. a good value. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, Cricket Twenty Four is the culmination of a decade of cricket video game development and includes teams from every corner of the globe. Players will be able to take on major cricket nations, including Australia, England, West Indies, New Zealand, Ireland, and more. Plus, for the first time ever, professional Indian T Twenty teams all set in over 50 detailed official stadia. Cricket 24 is the most complete video game simulation of cricket seen to date. The game is out on the 5th of October, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, Ben, since we last recorded, England lost the last T20 guy and therefore the series against Sri Lanka. They'd never lost a game, let alone a series, to Sri Lanka in T20i cricket before. It's a massive result for Sri Lanka, but for England, with two World Cups in Asia coming up, the, the way they play spin remains a concern. Uh, yeah, it does. And I don't know what the solution is apart from just practicing <laughs> lots of it in the nets and stuff. I, I suppose it also emphasises the importance of, of Nat Siver Brunt to that side um, in that she she was, I guess, the big miss in those T20Is and she and she, she's kind of got the, the range to play all sorts of situations and, and all sorts of different bowling styles, I guess. Um, yeah, that, that feels like the main concern from England point of view is it's not about the the rest and rotation or anything. It's just the fact that even their good players were struggling against spinners who are very good. And in the case of the Chelmsford game, especially the surface that, that helped them, but that will happen in World Cups. And so they need to get better at playing spin if they are to, you know, win either of the next two World Cups. It's, it's basically as simple as that, I think. I mean, they've come back in these two uh, ODIs so far. I mean, it's only 1-0 because the second was, was washed out. But I don't think they can take a huge amount of solace from that because with the Sri Lanka side, especially from a batting point of view, you get Atapatu, you're basically you're more than halfway to victory pretty much. And they got her early enough both times and wouldn't be that surprised if in in the third one either they struggle against spin batting first or Atapatu makes lots of runs. Uh, or they get her early and then win it quite comfortably. I think that that'd be the three ways it could go. Yeah you say England have started that ODI series quite well and Mahika Gore was exceptional the day but she got rid of Atapatu um took a couple of very eye catching wickets. Um, so that that's obviously a, a big bonus for England. Joe, what is your moment of the week? 
from County Cricket. Um, I think we've known for a couple of months now that Durham were going to go up, but that was confirmed this week. Last week, they beat Sussex to put themselves right on the brink, and then they didn't actually play in this round of games, but the way other results went, confirmed their promotion back up to the top tier for the first time since they were booted down to Division 2 in 2016 because of financial mismanagement. I think most of us would agree that was quite a draconian penalty. We've seen other counties uh, not receive the similar level of punishment. Yeah, only last week, uh, an ECB investigation found that Middlesex have been financially mismanaged over a number of years and are in a breach of the ECB financial regulations. They received suspended sentences. There's no threat of relegation there. I don't know if the two crimes, as it were, are comparable. But I think, yeah, as I say, most would, most would agree that Durham are quite harshly treated at the time. So it was a great story. It's a really, really good story. They've got loads of very watchable cricketers. Uh, they're playing really exciting cricket, baseball infused cricket. Um, I spoke to Scott Borthwick, their captain, at the start of last year, uh, and he said we should be winning this, winning this division. And then they were quite played quite cautious, cautious cricket. I think they drew eight of their games, played quite conservatively, not helped by England call ups and injuries. But they weren't, they didn't really deliver on what they could do. This year with a new coach, Ryan Campbell, an Aussie who's previously coached the Netherlands, they've just come out flying. Really, they've batted really aggressively. They've made a few audacious declarations. It's all very comparable to what we're seeing with the the England side and obviously Stokes a Durham player who doesn't really play for Durham but is not too far away uh, Cassia did a really good piece for wisdom.com on Durham and, and what's changed this year um, and there was yeah I, I thought a quite a, re a re revealing quote from Ryan Campbell their coach who said Stokes he knows how we're going about it he loves the way we play the facts are that he's sending messages all the time keeping an eye on our scoring rates and saying we're probably the one team that's got it right this year in county cricket so clearly an influence but you wouldn't want to overplay that because it's you know it's the players who actually played who mm. deserve this Ollie Robinson's been absolutely brilliant keep a batter with definite England aspirations um you've got Baz the leader the, the flying Dutchman who's come in and just been wonderful for them and also helped Netherlands to a World Cup sort of simultaneously uh really good scene bowlers in Matt Potts and Ben Rain top of the division two wicket taking charts and interestingly spin has not traditionally played much of a role up at Durham Generally, it's been the seamers who do the work, and that's still been true to a large extent. But they've, Ryan Campbell said, you know, he grew up playing at Perth, fast tracks, bouncy wickets, fast bowlers were key, but they always played a spin. He said, well, you, you always played a spin in whatever the conditions, and that's been a big part of their their strategy this year. So they had at different points: Ajaz Patel, the Kiwi, Matt Coonham, and the Aussie, uh, and Matt Parkinson back in form, uh, eight wickets against Sussex last mm. last week. So they've always had a spinner to supplement these these seamers. And yeah, Durham back in Division 1 have done it in absolute style. Um, second place still interestingly up for grabs. Worcestershire looked like they were pretty much home, but Sussex just got over the line against Leicestershire in a great match yesterday. And I think Sussex's final two games are Derbyshire and Gloucestershire, neither of which have won a game this year. So if they won both and Worcestershire lost both, I think that would put Sussex up. Hmm. Um, so still all to play for. Uh, and it's good, you know, the, the the season goes late into September. You really want something still live. Otherwise, it can be a bit of a depressing flat finish. Uh, and we've still got a championship race just about alive with Essex clinging on to Surrey. And we've got a Division 2 promotion race still going. And we've got a relegation battle between Kent and Middlesex in yeah. Div 1 as well. Um, it's, it's been really, really compelling stuff. Uh, and... Well, by definition, if you're in Division Two, then you're you're on your uppers a little bit, uh, and you're trying to rebuild and reframe your story. And obviously, it applies to Durham, as Joe says. Uh, massively applies to Worcestershire if they can get it over the line. I mean, they seem like they're perpetually in flux. They're losing players constantly to bigger, more well-heeled cricket clubs, uh, and yet they continue to bring good cricketers through. And if they were to pull it off, they're box seat favourites at the moment for that second place. That'd be a massive achievement. Brett Dolavera, who I interviewed at the start of the season, is like a little round table of captains. You know, undemonstrative bloke, but he's done brilliantly really to hold that place together this year. And so that'd be a great story. If it's not them, then Sussex is a good story, as we know, you know, transitional club with young kids coming through. Who were they if bottom they, last they year? They were bottom, yeah. well, couldn't win a game. Some really good young players again, especially with the bat. Brilliant to watch. If they were to pull it off, that would be great. And Leicestershire almost certainly now not going to happen because of this heartbreaking result this week. 
where they were chasing, I think, 490? 499. 499 and finished 15 runs short, having been blown away for 100 in the first innings. So 15 runs shy of a 500-run target. And if they'd won that, then they would have been hot on the heels of Worcestershire. So they probably won't make it, but they're also in the final with the 50 overs. So all of that, it's just another shot in the arm, really, for the 18, 18 clubs. And it reminds you that there's quality and intriguing cricket taking place all over the place. Definitely. I mean, Ben, your moment of the week is that oh, Leicester sorry. game. And, 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 but you also I spoke to, to, to Lewis Hill as well at Leicester. Sorry, Ben. Yeah, I did. I spoke, I spoke to Lewis Hill before this week. And this week is, a, is basically the biggest week in, in Leicester's modern history almost. I know they've won a few T20s, but properly in a promotion race and they've got the one day, one day cup final this Saturday. And this is in a season when, you know, it's a couple months ago that there were articles being written on the BBC and elsewhere that Leicester were properly in crisis. They'd lost Callum Parkinson, Colin Ackerman and Chris Wright all leaving the club. They uh, lost their head coach, Paul Nixon, in still kind of uh, murky circumstances. And this was also, you know, there's, there is always discussion around the worth of last year and that but that worth has been shown this season not just in the new I mean they bring through players all the time hence why they're being picked up by the counties Josh Hull's Josh, another one he, so Lewis really Hill good. said that he couldn't speak high enough and basically he's got the world at his feet I mean when you just he's six for seven he bowls left arm <laughs> quick and that's and 18 or 19 uh, yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and then but also it's not just about the players they, they bring through it's the the fact they provide sort of second chances to players who have you know down their luck but but still deserve them like Rishi Patel for example who now you have to say is one of the, the best or most promising young batters in the country uh is, you know was let go by Essex and then gets a go at Leicester because you have this this system and and Hill's another example himself you know he comes to his Leicester lad uh comes to the club and he makes debut at the age of 24 and before that was you know working in a news agent sort of playing club cricket his parents were paying for his petrol money to go to second 11 games and now he's captaining them to uh, a, a, a final in a comp in, you know they haven't won a 50 over game this this century so it's a, a brilliant story and Wait, when is the final sorry that's saturday this saturday so this coming saturday yeah yeah so and you know as much as it is heartbreaking he said you know they've gone into a lot of september's not having anything to play for and uh and so, so sorry did you speak to him after the no i spoke to him before the game yeah and i'm speaking to the ceo uh sean jarvis day for a bit of stuff about wider stuff around the club and i guess <laughs> They're, no, they're, they're, they're almost certainly not going to get promoted, but they're only three points off Sussex. I guess their biggest hope is that Durham don't quite have first sewn up. So if Durham sort of rouse themselves for a game against Worcestershire, give them the pummeling of their lives, sort of, you know, confer themselves, get on the piss for three or four days, turn up to Leicestershire, you know, still hung over, and then Leicestershire roll them over having having won the previous week, that maybe that's their, their And Sussex lose to the two teams who haven't won a game yet this yeah, year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if, if those things all happen, then uh, then, then, then Leicester can go up. Yeah, yeah, I think the one-day cup's the one, isn't it? Yeah, that's <laughs> <true>. <laughs> uh, But it's great. So Hanscom has just signed a two-year deal, which is quite telling that, you yeah. know, an established, uh, you know, international player has spent a season at Grace Road and thinks, I want to spend the next two years here. Mm. I think that's that's great news for the county. He was pretty confident that we and Mulder would be coming back as well and that that's what Leicester look for in overseas players, players who are going to like come and then come back again. That would be a third again. year in a row for yeah. Mulder, wouldn't it, mm. as well? The concern is just how they fill these spots that have been lost for the, the wet. How do they get? Well, they've got Travaskis, Travaskis from Durham, mm -hmm. who's a kind of light for light replacement for Parkinson. That looks quite a, a, you know, a solid signing. But their seamers, Chris Wright is a, is a big loss. Uh, I guess you, know, you just hope that Josh Hull can step up as a as a Red Bull bowler. Yeah, and Scrivens as well is a. Uh, I mean, he made a brilliant seventy odd in this game. Uh, and yeah. Mulder's bowling's come on quite a lot. Yeah, recently. yeah, and they, and they've they've also got Ben Cox in, who made a good fifty in this game. You know, he's famed for his his wicket keeping prowess. He pulled up an absolutely incredible leg size dumping in this game as well. Mm. Um, so that yeah, I mean, I guess what they're hoping for is that those those the likes of Richard Patel kick on and I don't know if they'll be pushing promotion again next season or if this just is mm. a glorious high for them but uh, they have shown you know why County Griffin needs less year I guess this season I think the WCM predictions might have had Yorkshire, Gloucestershire, Derbyshire as our top three and they're in fact <laughs> eighth, seventh and sixth <laughs> So that's good, isn't it? It's good cricket. Division two. Difficult, and poor knowledge. D d diff difficult division to call. Uh, big day at the bottom of Division one yesterday. So North Ants nearly defended 176 after a, a final day full of contriving. Uh, ben Sanderson took a hat trick, um, but Warwickshire eventually got over the line to win by two wickets, which means that North Ants are pretty much down. Uh, Kent had a, a truly disastrous final day. Um, they looked set to, to win big. They started the, the round in, in ninth. Uh, got a lot of batting points. Zach Crawley scored a runner ball 150. 
Uh, Looks set to win big going into the final day, uh, not start of the final day. Ten runs behind Kent in their follow-on with five wickets in hand. They lost two wickets straight away before Joe Clark and Brett Hutton put on 148 for the eighth wicket. Um, And Kent almost lost that game. So when they came out for the run chase, they thought, you know, only need to go fours or fives here. But actually had to block it out at the end. And to make matters worse for Kent, Middlesex escaped with a draw against Lancashire pretty much just down to the rain, really, to keep them above Kent in the table. By the way, just on Middlesex, they are currently outside the relegation zone with two batting bonus points all year. So they've got to 250 in the first innings twice in 12 games, and they are not in the relegation zone. Um, wow. Um, the difference between the top and the the lower reaches of the top division is really stark, actually. Mm. There's 10 teams, of course, in there, so perhaps it's to be expected. But it's a really stark difference. And on that, North Ants come to Surrey on Tuesday, and if Surrey win and win well, and Essex don't win and don't win well, then mm. it's all That's done it, and dusted. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a relatively big story earlier last week um, that the Rajasthan Royals were reportedly looking to buy Yorkshire. Uh, but according to Nick Holt in The Telegraph, that deal has collapsed. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that more if it turns out that that deal is, is still on. Um, Bob asks, what's the most obscure place you like one of Richard Gould's new T20 teams? So this is in response to uh, a story um, that was ECB Chiefs uh, pushing a 39-team T20 pyramid to replace the 100. Um, where, where, where do you think needs a, a T20 team? Because I think... Um, 39 teams is all the major counties plus all the minor counties plus one. So there's, what, what is the plus one that we want? I'd really like, um, I know it's not in England, but I'd, I'd really like an outpost in like Inverness. Um, you I was going to say Scotland. That yeah. That was the natural way to go. But I think just the more north you go. There's a just lovely ground at Aberdeen. Yeah. Beautiful ground at Aberdeen. That's north, isn't it? Yeah, north that's the north. north, that's, north. That's, that's, that's Maybe north. it's like Outer Hebrides. Just... Yeah. <laughs> You've got a Tuesday night and Outer Hebrides as a T in a T <laughs> twenty game. Really far south, Gibraltar. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway, moving on. Uh to finish off, we've got a great question from Richard Holliman. Uh, hello Wisdom team. I'm a passionate advocate of your podcast and listen weekly as an Englishman living in Sydney. I heard statistics recently that despite their greatness, Broad and Anderson had bowling averages around 40 runs per wicket in their first 20 test matches, which made me appreciate the decision of the current leadership to back Zach Crawley for a prolonged run in the team, which was rewarded with that amazing 100 at Old Trafford. My question is, which batters from the 21st century for England do you think would have had a better test career if they had been given 38 test matches to prove themselves as Zach Crawley has. So Richard has listed um, a, a group of players who played 11 or fewer test matches. Ian Ward, Anthony McGrath, Ed Smith, Oway Shah, Michael Carberry, Sam Robson, Adam Lythe, Tom Wesley, Mark Stoneman, Jason Roy, Dan Lawrence, Sam Billings and Alex Lees. But I'm going to expand that to, to 20 test matches to include the likes of Ravi Bopara, James Vince, uh, Owen Morgan, uh, Rob Key, etc, etc. Um, I think that's a great question. Uh, mm. Joe, do you want to go first? Sure, of the list that... Um... The Richard sent over the Carberry was one that jumped out for me. Uh, you know, if you can average near enough thirty against Mitchell Johnson in that form, you probably would have done all right in your home conditions against some significantly inferior attacks. Uh, he also made big hundreds when he got in, didn't he? Yeah, like doubles, and he made a triple as well. Did he, did he make? He did make. A he triple. did make a triple. Yeah. yeah, and he was also one of those players who, who seemed to get better with age as well. I think if they'd picked him kind of thirty, early thirties, I think he'd have done a really good job as an opener. Certainly, given. <laughs> the poor job that other openers did and other players got given a longer shot. I th- he was a, a victim of the of the fact that you lose an Asher series. Players that just have to be discarded, that's just that's the rule. Also uh, a player who made white ball runs, which t- tells you that he was a good good player full yeah. stop. So he's he's the one that jumps up. And the other one, Oe Shah as well. I, only, mm. I was surprised he only played six tests. I thought he played a few more than that. Uh, Under-19 uh, World Cup winner, captain that side. Really good player. Had that issue... Do you remember this, Phil, that he was so tense when he was playing test cricket, he gripped the bat handle so hard that he was getting cramp, which actually genuinely affected his his ability to score runs when he was playing test cricket. Um, so, you know, if he could have got over that, felt a bit more relaxed in the environment, um, I think he'd have been a good player as well. He, really good first-class record. He was a slightly um, kind of offbeat character, I suppose. Uh, he was made captain of Middlesex and then the captaincy was taken off him halfway through his first season because they just thought, it's just not quite the right fit for you. So he was a sort of 
prodigy player. The best player is a 19-year-old in England. But quite a kind of eccentric sort of bloke, I suppose. Likeable fella, but um, not kind of of the sort of mental components that you that guarantee you runs, if you like. So he was a sort of quirky kind of character, idiosyncratic bloke. And again, showed in and played, 50, showed in fifty over cricket that he could play. He could score runs against the best attack. Yeah, as well. yeah. But that cramp innings you talk of, it was in Mumbai. He made eighty eight and thirty eight in his on his debut, and he was brilliant. And then I think he played one more Test in England, and he he got caught off the glove for six against the West Indies in a game where everyone got hundreds. It's weird you remember this stuff. And that was it. And that was it. And he was done. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that that what a debut that is. Eighty eight batting at three against in an in, in an England win in Mumbai. Yeah, under that, Fintoff in 06. Yeah. It was a really good knock. Um, ben, any any names? Well, for again from that list would be uh, would be Adam Light, uh, and just because of how he's spoken about, really, like he is the one that people say, like, oh, he he was so talented. Like he, you know, and he obviously had an absolute horror show against. Uh, Against again an Australia side, and I guess this is an Ashes series. It's a recurring again. theme, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> but but the, but the hundred he made against New Zealand was was really good, albeit in a game uh, England lost. But yeah, I mean he he was one again who had sort of the the range to his game where he could have been a success uh, in in a, in a variety of formats. Although England was so stocked in Marvel cricket that he never was that close in those. But he like he could attack against the new ball in a way that England would now really like, and at the time I suppose was so, seen as a bit of sort of a and an and airiness which they didn't like i guess mm. um I, I i've always thought that Bapara got more opportunities and, and vince as well to be honest i, I think if vince, if vince made his debut uh in the current regime and was given a long go i mean his last not for England was what 70 odd against new zealand uh, his last test match was when he was what maybe 26 27 years old and he made a double hundred the last innings before he selected the first squad that summer and mm. yet somehow didn't d- didn't make it in yeah groundhog yeah. day <laughs> uh phil any more names just rob key really yeah good player really really good player um wasn't for some reason wasn't quite the right time i don't think he got on with fletcher who was coach and all dominant all conquering at the time uh he was associated with fred and harmison that probably didn't help his cause i think he's actually said this hasn't he in the magazine yeah and probably elsewhere i think obviously. they were seen yeah as seen as a bit of a troublesome three and harmison and flintoff weren't getting dropped so <laughs> yeah it's like putting the kids separating the kids in class i think there's a bit of an element yeah. of that <laughs> but you know a double hundred at lords albeit against the average west indies side and a really good 90 to win the following test match on a tricky pitch at old trafford Made a good 50 in Australia against Brett Lee. Steve War rated him, etc., etc. He kept getting out to medium paces. Kept getting out to people like Damian Martin or someone. He made a really good Steve 80. Steve War as well, was it? Yeah, yeah, War got him out. Made a really good 80 in that Joburg game, the Hoggard game, when Hoggard took seven and they won it. And Strauss made 100. And Triscothic made that amazing 100 in the third innings. And he got a really good 80 in the first innings alongside Strauss from number three. And you think of the bowlers in that game. So he could make test match runs, definitely could make test match runs. And I think he'd have made a fair few uh, in that top order somewhere if he'd been given a chance. Mm. He's also talked about the fact that um, he overcomplicated the game way too much in his early days. And it was only towards the end when he was like, well, I'll just stick to my strengths and and play positively, which might ring a few bells from what we're seeing with the the test team now, that he realised that's when I play my best cricket. And I, I really think that's been a big part of why England play the way they do as well. Obviously, in combination with Stokes and mm. McCullum, but I think that's played a huge part in forming Definitely. Key's view of how cricket should be played. Yeah. And also a couple of things. His last test match was when he was 25. And you think, like, a player that good, surely should deserve to go later on. But also, a big part of this discussion is who the other players are who are roughly your age. And Key wasn't, was of a similar age of that England team that went to number one in the world, maybe slightly older than a, than a few of them. Um, anyway, uh, that was a fun conversation at the end of the show, just just reeling off names from, from 20 years ago. Um, anyway, that is all for today. Cheers, Phil. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, Ben. This has been the Wisden Cricket Weekly podcast in association with Lathwaite's Wine, who we also must thank for generously uh, providing uh, all the wine for our live show uh, last week, which was, which was we, we had fun. Um, we don't know. Don't know if if, if the that mean? did. It, was, it went all right. It went well. No, I think so too. I think my, my favourite bit was the um was was the quiz when uh one of one of our listeners took on Butch in a one on one on the buzzer quiz um 
that, that was good fun. It's anyway, annoying you didn't get the Kenya one. You could see it was he was he was ticking at that point. I yes, think, yeah. yeah. Um, it helped that one of the one of the answers was was Butch himself, which yeah. gave him a bit of an advantage. Anyway, that's all for today's show. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week. <laughs>